Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Role of Clinical Decision Support in Ensuring Patient Safety. On behalf of Becker's Healthcare, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Before we begin, I'm going to walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. If you have any questions throughout today's webinar, you can type them into the Q&A chat box you see on your screen. We will start today's session with a quick poll question. You'll be able to select your answer directly in the slide box on your screen. Thank you in advance for your participation. You will also find a few other engagement tools on your dashboard. Please check out your resources section and make sure you fill out our session survey. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you, you use to log into today's webinar to access the recording. Lastly, if at any time you have trouble with the audio or video, please try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A chat box, and we are always here to help. At this time, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our presentation. Our presentation. Dr. Lindsay R. Kelly is the Associate Chief Pharmacy Officer for the University of Michigan Health, Michigan Medicine, and Ann Arbor, Michigan. She serves as Program Director for the PGY-1 Community Pharmacy Residency and Adjunct Faculty at the University of Michigan College of Pharmacy, where she enjoys teaching pharmacy law. Areas of research interest and professional achievement include practice innovation, workforce develop development, advocacy, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Kelly earned her PharmD from the University of Arizona in Tucson. She completed a pharmacy practice residency at Abbott Northwestern Hospital in Minneapolis and received her MS from the University of Minneapolis College of Pharmacy while completing a two-year health system pharmacy administration residency at the University of Minnesota Health. She has been an active member of the National Pharmacy Association, state affiliations, and advisory council. She currently serves as the chair for the American Society of Health System Pharmacists section of Pharmacy Practice Leaders. Dr. Kelly was honored with the ASHP New Practitioners Forum Distinguished Service Award in 2010 and recognized as a fellow in 2019. In her free time, she enjoys cycling, playing with her wife, and playing with her two kid bulls. We also have Dr. Tina Moen, who has spent the last 22 years in the healthcare information technology industry, providing clinical leadership to colleagues and clients in the U.S. and abroad. Currently, she is the general manager of Micromedics and chief pharmacy officer with Meritus. Previously, she served as the chief health officer and chief pharmacy officer at IBM. In this role, she led a clinical leadership team working across the business to provide clinical leadership and support for strategy and sales. Prior into moving the healthcare and information technology industry. She worked as a clinical pharmacist in the areas of pediatrics, home health care, HIV, and organ transplantation. In her clinical experience spans inpatient, outpatient, retail, and mail order specialty pharmacy practice settings. She also received her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from Creighton University. Outside of work, she enjoys travel, hiking, and is halfway through her goal to see a game at all of the Major League Baseball Stadium. Dr. Kelly, Dr. Mullen, thank you so much for being here today. I'll now turn the floor over to Dr. Mullen to begin. Thank you so much. Lindsay, you and I are busy people based on all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, I didn't know you had a goal of seeing all the ballparks. I uh, now have to compare indeed. notes. I do indeed, yes. I just I just caught one in Phoenix this weekend. But let's get to let's get to our topic at hand. Thank you everyone for joining us pleasure. Um, we'll, hopefully we'll have opportunity to um, chat with all of you um, via the Q&A section of uh, the screen here. Feel free to ask questions along the way. We'll be monitoring those, but thrilled to spend some time with, with Lindsay for sure and all of you talking about a topic that I think is probably really near and dear to most clinicians' hearts, and that is patient safety. I know myself in my early clinical career, um, I, I realize that most clinicians go into healthcare because we are caregivers by nature, and um, and then therefore the I idea of patient safety is such a central key key piece to um, certainly getting people better and and not not contributing to them um, having any other uh, untoward effects along the way. So would love to um, have lots of questions about uh, what 
Lindsay and I have experienced and, and what we're, how we think about from our different perspectives in the industry, um, Lindsay being in, in all of the practice areas that were described in her intro and myself sitting over here in health tech, how those two things can, um, those two constituent groups can come together and, and drive towards additional areas of um, support around that important initiative of patient safety. So with that, Lindsay, I know we got your bio, but would love for you to give us another little introduction of yourself and, and what, you're, what you're up to these days and keeping yourself busy with. Sure. Uh, thanks, Tina. Thanks, everyone, as well, for being here. Um, so I currently serve as did at the University of Michigan Health. Um, so we recently have uh, taken on two expansions. So I spend a lot of my time thinking about pulling systems across other institutions. We recently bought a five community hospital health system um, in central Michigan, and we are working on expanding our specialty pharmacy. So I spend a lot of time in two different roles, thinking about how we can take what we've learned here at our main campus and um, potentially bring it to other sites, but also learn from what they've done. Sometimes our community sites are a little bit more agile. So I, it's been really fun to learn about all of that. That's really cool. Um, the, tell me a little bit about when you, when you think about your connection to patient safety throughout your career, what's your sort of high level um, view of that part of being a pharmacist? Yeah, I think it's been fun. You know, when we think about, when I think about how people develop, um, and this is true in other areas, you start kind of with your individual view and you think really about like, how does it impact me? How does it impact my world? I think one of the things that I've really enjoyed growing as a leader is watching that individual perspective grow from my practice as a clinician, which is where I first had my encounters with patient safety, some of them good and some of them um, I think I would redo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then watching it, you know, kind of as you grow as a leader and watching it across maybe your team, your department, um, your hospital, and now, you know, really looking at it, how it applies across an entire institution or enterprise. I think that has been one of the coolest things, um, specifically looking at like how other institutions apply systems of mm. safety, um, where they rely on humans versus uh, technology and how different leaders think about that. Yeah, I love that. We have, we have all sorts of topics to talk about just based on just those little tidbits in there. Uh, your comments about the different perspective as you're sort of moving through your career and now looking at um, across across you know various sites and across the system, similar echo my own perspective in in my early days of being a you know frontline um, uh, care provider and sort of moving now into a role I'm in in health tech and um, leading a business that provides content and and insights for folks to do just that take good care of patients. Um, has really shifted um, has shifted the way I think about um, how I contribute to the world, how I contribute to patient safety and the care of human beings. Um, but it all comes back down to just that, those human beings individually um, who, who are looking for or needing our care. So good. So last to talk about, um, just a brief overview for <coughs> everybody on the call. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what patient safety means to clinicians as we just started. Um, this idea of avoidable harm, which interestingly, has lots of um, uh, variations around the world, as I've learned, um, around how how we as clinicians think about that that phrase. To your point, Lindsay, some tools and strategies that um, can help support patient safety. Um, talk a little bit about what we're doing here at Micromedics, and we'd love to get your feedback and thoughts about um, more things that we can do to help make the, the lives and jobs of the clinicians we support and, and most importantly the patients that they support uh, more um, a safer environment and 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 quicker um, uh, resolution of any risk or or um, illness on the patient side talk a little bit about this 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 uh, idea of evidence-based medicine and and to your point as we talked the other day what do you do when the evidence isn't that great <laughs> um, and then and then the idea of uh, what we do with new medical knowledge and and how how long it takes all of us to believe and trust and know what to do with it in in practice. But first, we're going to get a little bit of audience participation, as as was mentioned at the opening. We'd love for you all to um, weigh in on this particular question: How many patients are affected by avoidable harm? So we'll give you a, a couple of moments here to think about what your answer may be. My understanding is you can just click right on your screen 
and we will click over into some of the results in a moment here. Uh, I asked this question in a presentation, similar presentation I was giving, let's see, I guess it was in May in London. That one was in person, but it was really interesting, the, the span of answers we got, uh, perspectives we got, and then the rich discussion that ensued from it, uh, sort of getting to my point earlier about um, what people think about when they think about avoidable harm. All right, so that hopefully gave you all plenty of time. Let me click over into our results here. So we have, so it looks like three choices got, I'm seeing three. I don't know if you're seeing more than that, Lindsay. Oh, here we go, there's all four. Oh, yeah, there's all four. So 50% of you think it's one in 10. 25% of us think it's one in 15. Nobody thinks it's one in 20. And 25% of us think it's one in 25. Interestingly, it's one in 20. <laughs> Um, which I think is, um, from my perspective, uh, sort of not surprising, but it, but as I sort of alluded to, I think it all depends on what we think about when we think about avoidable harm. So, so given that, Lindsay, what, what was, before maybe you knew the answer to this, what would you have said? And then what is your thoughts on how you define avoidable harm? Uh, well, now I have the luxury of knowing the answer, but I probably would have picked one in 15. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I think maybe I don't, maybe I just don't trust the world as much as other people. I don't know where I'm at with that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think avoidable harm, um, obviously anything that happens to a patient that could have been prevented. I think um, we often, I think historically, I've thought of avoidable harm very much in the clinical context. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I've shifted that a little bit recently. I would say more recently, especially given our work in population health and specialty pharmacy and really thinking about clinical footprints, I've really been thinking about avoidable harm in terms of omission. Ah. And, mm -hmm. and I think when I was a practicing pharmacist, that was, there was one narrow definition of that in terms of like, you know, order verification or order administration. And um, I've been thinking about it in a much greater context across the, the healthcare environment. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I like I like that framework around omission. I I also have had a shift in how I think about this phrase over the course of my career, and particularly um, the last probably ten years, as we're hearing and talking more and more about um, uh, how people take care of themselves when they're outside of the four walls of the healthcare. Um, ecosystem, if you will, <laughs> which is where most of us live most of our lives, right? So there's the avoidable harm that that I, as a clinician, am responsible for avoiding any harm I might inflict. Um, but then also let me broaden that, that out a bit and think about how can I also help the patient avoid harm that, um, that may happen when they're not standing in front of their care team and um, living most of their lives, thankfully, not talking to clinicians <laughs> about their care. Um, and, and some of that is omission on their side too, or, or you know, gets back to patient safety or patient education and all the things that mm -hmm. we talk about, but maybe don't always lump into a, a framework of um, avoiding, avoiding harm. Indeed. Yeah, it's interesting. What, what sorts of um, uh, ideas or conversations come up around this topic in your organization? Is there, is there, sort of standard terminology so that everyone's working from the same playbook or do you still have opportunities to get everybody on the same page so we're all uh, marching in the same direction? Uh, I would love to tell you that we have reached 100% and we are, we've we done, we're done, we're checking that box. Yeah. Um, so I think there's, there's a couple of things. So I'll, I'll start with like our broad strategy. So our broad strategy within the organization I work is really built around high reliability. So we started on a journey, which is probably a journey many people are on. Um, we started on a journey probably th three or more years ago now to really improve our environment and ecosystem as a high reliability organization. I think two things that have come out of that. One is, um, I think, something we would expect around systems thinking and systems perspectives. We focused a lot on uh, the way that we monitor patients and thinking about how specifically what you're saying, how do we ensure that we're getting the information we need when they leave our four walls. Mm -hmm. um, and so trying to create better systems. Um, over the last two years, we've engaged in some system design around therapeutic drug monitoring, ensuring we're getting the right labs for each you know, medical subspecialty. 
Um, and th that was a big chunk of work. But I think the most, actually the most impactful thing that we've done related to high reliability is I think bring a little humanity into the culture and specifically from our leaders. Mm -hmm. um, so we actually, I think better than I've seen at a lot of organizations I've been at before are living and leading um, kind of the humility and the questioning attitude. And it's not, we're not 100% yet. We have some areas where we could improve. Um, but we, you know, we have huddles where our executive leaders and even, you know, myself within our department are having conversations with our staff and encouraging them to hold us accountable if we make mistakes, which is always a good idea. But it, it took a little bit of practice, I think, for all of us to say, oh, like, I, I appreciate you raising that concern. Let me step back and think about that. Yeah. Um, so we've seen a really big impact there. That's really interesting. I think it's such a, you know, whether you're talking about healthcare or your family unit or what have you, that ability to feel safe enough um, to admit that you didn't do it perfectly <laughs> is hard. It's hard for humans. And, and, and some environments make it harder because unfortunately some environments have demonstrated themselves to be quite punitive and um, not have any room for error. But certainly those are conversations we're having uh, in the micromedics organization as well about no human is perfect in whatever they might be trying to do. And so mistakes will happen um, at different different steps along the way. And how do we um, infuse the right level of humility and, and safety in an organization so that people are comfortable um, pointing out uh, where there might be either some risk or some already, um, uh, already happened um, circumstances that may have caused harm. Do you feel like the say, when you talk about humility and that culture of humility is is the psychological safety, I guess, um, component part of that in your organization as well? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So the psychological safety, um, you know, you're talking about families, I think actually comes up in a number of different environments, right? So um, we're, we're obviously talking about it within our teams. Um, it's been it's been an interesting journey. I think it is different. We've had different success in different care teams and in different care environments. So mm -hmm. specifically thinking about within our acute care teams, I think we've seen some early success in countering the power gradient, you know, having conversations where, um, you know, folks who might not be at the level of the attending or whoever the senior clinician is on that team are more comfortable escalating concerns. Um, it probably builds on our, like the history we've had around just culture and those kinds of things, but maybe even something as simple as hand washing and that conversation. Nice. Um, but what we see in our clinics is a little bit different. So in acute care, I think it's at least in the environments I work in, it's really common to see these like layers. So you have anywhere from a learner, uh, potentially in any of the health fields, all the way up through senior physicians, attendings, different senior providers, even our extenders. Um, and then in the clinic, what we see is a little bit different. So you have often a, a medical assistant, and then you end up skipping, at least in our, our environment, a number of other um, you know, members of the care team. It's often a medical assistant having a conversation with the provider who just came out of the room, or you know, um, having a conversation maybe ahead of that visit. And in our environment, we still have some opportunity for, I think, two things. One, we often end up with orders um, asked or being given to the medical assistant, particularly around vaccinations, ahead of them getting entered in the computer. So I think that's an opportunity. But the other thing we see related to high reliability is um, our MAs, as you might expect, just don't have a lot of positive experience escalating mm -hmm. concerns to providers um, at that level and feeling like they have the psychological safety in place to say, you know, hey, Dr. Jones, I noticed that you just asked for this vaccine. The patient record displays that they just had that vaccine. Are you sure that's what you intended? Those kinds of things I think are still pretty difficult. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so interesting. I, I, I very similar sentiment heard um, when I was in Europe uh, earlier this year as well. Um, again, indicating that it's a, uh, it's a humanity challenge <laughs> um, and, and in all sorts of industries, right? You hear these, these sorts of stories in you know, the automobile manufacturing industry and you know, somebody along the line recognized that there was a flaw that may have, been, may have caused some um, risk to the, the safe, the safe um, 
uh, driving of that car down the down the road, but they didn't feel safe enough to raise their hand. And so I think, uh, as as you said, you'd, you'd love to say we're already there and we're perfect, but it's it's a journey that that will really never reach the there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, I think that's fascinating that there's when we talk about things like this, patient safety um, focus in organizations. There's a humanity side of it, which is can't be overlooked. And, and unfortunately, I think historically often has been overlooked. I think we're getting better about that as a society, but certainly have a long way to go, as you point out. Then there's a process component and then, of course, a technology component. So I want to talk about process next um, and, and hear what you've got. You guys have been up to when when I was in um, I can't remember what city I was in for heaven's sakes, but at the <laughs> recent uh, Health Connect Partners uh, meeting uh, and had a, a room full of, of esteemed colleagues and pharmacists from around the country talking about the same topic. We got all sorts of interesting um, ideas thrown out around the room about things people are doing in their organizations to drive this culture of patient safety. A couple of examples here. Um, you know, we talked about one, somebody from an ambulatory site talked about that once a quarter they show all of their near miss experiences in a meeting and really normalize that conversation. Uh, we talked to somebody else from an inpatient organization talked about a medication mentor who is a clinical pharmacist that, that partners up with uh, some of their travel nurses and, um, you know, make sure that these travel nurses who are sort of probably oftentimes um, rotating through lots of different settings and lots of different teams and, and maybe not settling in as much as might be best for the patient. So how does the medication mentor um, for those travel nurses, nurses help them all make sure that patient safety is um, never compromised? I had another inpatient uh, pharmacist talk about a zero harm initiative that they have in place at their organization. And, and again, normalizing the um, conversation around what our goals are and and where we um, where we hit the goals and where we might have missed the goals in terms of patient safety. So a lot of process things that, that are um, allowing the conversation to again be normalized. What, what sort of process things have you put in place in some of your organizations? Yeah, I I like the idea of the way that it, the conversation around safety is being normalized, right? So I think that's pretty common. Um, part, part of the way that we're approaching it at a high level is through our HRO or high reliability organization, specifically the huddles that I mentioned earlier, where, so our teams are at a, at a micro level meeting in the morning talking about you know ways to improve process, but then anything that comes up that is a significant concern or a significant risk, they're able to escalate through a daily huddle at the department level and then all the way up to executive leaders through our operational daily management. So that could be something um, that's very structural, like our clean room systems have gone down and we need to talk about dating. It can also be some of the more serious things related to entire technical or technological systems going down. Um, you know, what do you do when your lab system goes down and those kinds of things. So I think that's, but that's been nice. But some of the other stuff is just, it's very, it's very simple con concerns that are escalated and you have the people who need to respond to it right there. Mm -hmm. um, and then it gets communicated back down the next day, which I think is really great. We've done some smaller stuff with that, both at the department level and then um, at the team level. Specifically, one of the things that I really like are systems of governance. So where we, across multiple sites, which is common, I think within a number of organizations, I'll use our community pharmacy uh, sites and our specialty pharmacy I talked about, we were expanding. A lot of the work that those teams do is similar and slightly has slight variation. And so the leaders in those teams created a committee, like a centralized operations committee where variations come forward and they discuss and decide a standard way of moving forward. Um, and I think that has allowed our teams to feel safer in the mm -hmm. environment as they float f back and forth, but it's also allowed us to better leverage, I think, our computer systems, because we're not building 19 different ways of doing it. <laughs> we have one way, and if you start to you know, get off the, off the rails, it's easy to know that you've done that. Um, and then we've implemented, I think, some additional, you know, kind of like, I think similar to what you mentioned with um, teams. So we have, you know, like there are opportunities. We saw a lot of tech turnover, which I'm sure a lot of people have over the last few years. So our technicians were turning over quite frequently. We had a lot of onboarding. And so we developed a very similar mentoring strategy where our technicians come in, they're assigned to 
um, in small groups to mentors, um, and then they're, they're able to have someone that they can um, connect with. We also, to the same point, developed our own tech training system or program so that we could uh, make sure that our, our teams were really learning what they needed to be successful as they were coming in. Yeah. Interesting. I think the uh, we have heard uh, even in, in the health tech space that the pharmacy technician, um, that there's a challenge <laughs> around everybody having enough pharmacy technicians. So I guess that's a, a note to all of us to tell um, tell young people that might be looking to see what they should do in their career, that that's a, <laughs> a yes, please. ripe opportunity. Yes, ripe opportunity. Um, again, I think the this idea of any problem that we're looking at in, in the modern times has a humanity, human component, as we've discussed, this process component, and then and then a technology component. So I wanted to put up one more one more slide for folks. This um, things that we certainly talk about a lot at Micromedics, and we'd love to hear Lindsay your your take on this. And again, reminder to the audience: if there's any questions you want us to sort of double down on, please feel free to put those in the Q and A box. Um, but some of the things we think about, and then always like to take out to um, you know, the folks that we're we're aiming to serve and support with clinicians taking care of patients, are um, these things that. Um, some technology assets can help with. So um, learning from system failures to improve, uh, to inform improvements. We've heard a lot about that in the market. And I think we've talked a little bit about normalizing those conversations. The use of um, electronic health records and prescribing systems with screening capabilities, you know, that's been, as we all know, around for many years. And, and there's often a bit of a love-hate relationship with them for a variety of reasons, but Certainly, as somebody who's been in health tech now for 20 plus years, um, encourage everybody out there who's in practice to hold vendors accountable for what you need it to be and, um, and making sure it's actually supporting you as opposed to potentially getting in your way. <laughs> um, the easy access to evidence-based clinical decision support tools, of course, that's right in our wheelhouse here in micromedics and, and, and our job to make sure we're listening to the market and understanding what um, folks need us to provide that that may not being uh, being be being provided as well as it could be today. Structured medication reviews. I know that uh, most organizations have some flavor of that. Um, I heard a lot in London, in particular, about this idea of deprescribing to streamline regimens. I, I love that personally as um, somebody who took care of my dad the last ten years of his life, and he was on rightfully a lot of things, but probably more than you needed to be. And then of course, shared decision-making, which is, is um, certainly something that's been well embedded into lots of organizations, but probably has some room to expand as well. When you think about some of those, these things or other strategies, um, particularly around the technology side, Lindsay, what, what do you think about that's working well and or that um, there's a gap in organizations like ours can continue to um, work to fill some of those gaps. Yeah, I, so I would say, we'll start with what I think is working well. I actually think in the organizations that I've had the opportunity to work in, we've had excellent access to evidence-based, both education and information, but also clinical decision support. And clinical decision support to me is a little bit of a double-edged sword because the information is out there and you could certainly build a clinical de decision support tool whether you're utilizing forcing functions or pop-ups or anything like that. I think part of what we still run into is the fatigue of how frequently and at what level of impact or importance do you use those? Yeah. Um, and we've had this conversation a lot, even around, um, you know, I talked a little about therapeutic drug monitoring and, and specialty pharmacy. And so we've talked about how do we make sure that our providers know that these labs are associated with this particular medication, and that might be different than what has historically been done, and how do we ensure that our patients get those labs completed? Do we create some kind of clinical decision support? Do we, and ultimately what we ended up land, landing on is we use structured orders and protocols for the labs, but then we actually have started referring, we actually created a, a, a BPA that allows our providers to refer um, patients on these medications to a pharmacist. So they can just say, you know what, I understand this is complicated and there's some additional monitoring and they can choose to do that themselves, obviously, because that's absolutely, uh, you know, one of the pathways. But if, if desired, they can say, you know what, like, 
I'm just going to let y'all handle it and kick it over via referral. And so I think that utilization of clinical decision support was one that I had not previously considered. I'm always thinking about it in terms of here's a different recommendation or here's the preferred treatment. Um, and this idea that you could use it to refer to a more comprehensive care pathway um, was a really cool utilization that I we had not done before. Yeah, that is interesting. I think the this uh, um, history in sorry, I'm stumbling over my own words. In roles previous, I talked a lot about um, the role that AI would play in in healthcare and would and should and could and will and is to some extent, but still still lots of room. Um, and finding sort of similar to your comments about the alert fatigue and how much do you engineer something um, before it becomes over-engineered, <laughs> which, which I think humans are really good at over-engineering. Um, this role of whether it's AI or any other form of technology, what, where should it be supporting versus where the human should be supporting and, and having, a, um, having a human decision because there's maybe something ethical involved or a patient preference involved or what have you, you know, where does the technology need, need to go? And then what, at what point does the human care team um, need, to, need to have some influence over the, the next recommendation or decision as well? I think that's an area that's so gray, uh, but one that we all are sort of are duty bound to continue to work on. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, part of the smile you see on my face is that I'm really excited about this as an opportunity. And I, I, I understand, and I don't want any, um, you know, belief that I don't understand the, the assumptions and the things I'm making in the way that I think about this. But one of the things we've seen here in Michigan is that we've seen a partnership between our major payer and a quality group here, particularly in oncology, to place pharmacists in community oncology physician groups. And we do this because we know that most patients receive their oncology care from community physicians. We also know that the differentiation between the likelihood that an oncology practitioner will follow the latest evidence varies from an academic medical center to a community provider. And so placing the pharmacist in that physician group, we've seen an improvement in treatment, but also in oral oncology in particular, um, all of the monitoring and follow-up that's, re that's required for that. So we see you know, improvement in the overall patient care. Um, thinking about that model, one of the things I like to ideate about, which makes my oncology practitioner friends crazy. So <laughs> a lot of that's built on, on NCCN guidelines, right? Like for many things there are, I shouldn't say for many, for some treatment plans, there's an NCCN guideline and we follow it until we can't. And so I am really excited about the idea, and we are absolutely not there yet. We've tested this within some of the AI platforms that you might pull from an NCCN guideline or from the literature that's out there within an AI structure. And, and the practitioner, or in, this, in the way that we work, a pharmacist would be presented with an initial recommendation mm -hmm. based on the patient's information. And then it would be within your realm to say, it's almost like, uh, we'll go back to baseball, like sh shaking off a pitch recommendation, right? Yeah. So so you might get the initial recommendation and say, no, like that's not gonna work for this patient, but we might be able to improve the frequency with which patients receive the appropriate treatment the first time mm -hmm. by utilizing AI to do some of that. And again, like there's a number of dominoes that have to fall to make that work, but that is kind of like, I think that's a really cool application of, of you know evidence and AI to ensure that we're decreasing inequities in care. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, I, I like the baseball analogy. Thank you for that. <laughs> we'll see how many people we've lost with our, our love of baseball here, but um, it is it is it is a journey. Like like the previous journey we talked about that um, as AI continues to um, or any other advanced analytics continue to advance, um, finding where that right line is, where you do need to shake off the pitch for whatever the reasons are. Right. The the Again, when you think about evidence-based medicine, patient preference and patient characteristics and things like that are part of that, which the which the quote system may not be aware of, um, or or again, it's a you know a religious belief or a just personal belief of whatever ilk may yep. make that that by the book recommendation not the right one for that patient. So really, really interesting. 
Um, so I want to talk a little bit about a specific a specific use case that we see oftentimes in um, in our uh, client base. Um, so our IV compatibility um, section of our product is our, um, not surprisingly, very frequently, if not most used section. You know, what I don't know what percentage you might of patients you might say are on the two two different meds uh, that are delivered via IV, but there's lots of potential risk. <laughs> it's ripe ripe for problems, right? Um, so it's really important uh, to us because it's important to our end users that um, that how we display the evidence is as clear as possible, and and how that's displayed may what makes it clear may differ based on the uh, end user looking at it, as a nurse looking at it, as a pharmacist looking at it, um, et cetera. So we'd love to hear your thoughts on whether it's IV compatibility specifically or just technology and its end users, um, what, what you feel like the needs are from, from somebody sitting in your shoes, sharing with somebody sitting in my shoes for us to be thinking about. Uh, sure. Um... I'm going to recognize the time frame we have because I could probably talk to you for a while and we often do. But, um, so I, I think I'm going to go back to this concept of systems and, you know, kind of evidence informing an initial recommendation. And so I think there's an area where I think we could optimize. I think some of that is around what we've done, I think, in some instances where we're incorporating that evidence into the system. So the system is already making its best attempt at a good recommendation or at even with IV compatibility, right? To create alarms and triggers in our pump libraries and things like that, where we know that we can use that information. I think there's probably some room to continue to grow with those models um, and really you know, continue to bring that foundational evidence in to the system so that it becomes increasingly foolproof. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other area that I'm excited about, which is if I step out of the acute care world, which is where I think a lot of my um, clinical application is, if I step out of that and I think about, again, like this idea of equity, inequity, and health disparities, one of the things that we encounter is that we can identify, you know, given a lot of the technology that's growing around, like what, pe what populations and what patients specifically might have needs, but we aren't yet great at connecting back to what opportunities exist to fill that gap. So mm -hmm. in medication specifically, I think one of the ones that um, I talk about a lot is we might identify that a patient who requires an expensive medication doesn't have the means to you know, afford it. And in that realm, there are a number of pathways you could go down, right? You could say manufacturer assistance program, you could say grant funding, you could say some other insurance um, you know, uh, 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 offering. And so I think it would be really fun for me to have those kinds of responses come back when we identify that a patient has a need to say, oh, well, here are some opportunities in this world about medication. Here are the grants that exist for that particular medication or disease state. And right now we rely on humans to know that. They develop expertise in that area. Um, and so I think that is an opportunity even further, and maybe this exists and I haven't seen it, around some of the non-medication things like you know, food deserts or things like that. So we can say, you know what, like not only did we identify that you have an issue, but here are some resources that, and it's not difficult for us. It doesn't take a lot of time intensive labor and personnel to build, yeah. right? Cause we, we do that now. It's just, it's, it, we're fairly clunky at it, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that, um, talk to me a little bit about how the acute, um, outpatient and then patient out in the wild. <laughs> so not even outpatient, like actually out in the wild, yeah. um, how those are starting to blend more and more all the time and what the um, one, what the partnership needs to look like to ensure patient safety between sort of the owners of those um, different venues need to work together to ensure that there's not gaps. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? How, what you guys are doing around that? Yeah, I think, um, so to your point about shared decision-making, I think we are at an individual patient level getting better at stepping back from, I think, what has previously been a maternalistic or paternalistic approach to how we care for patients, like the whole concept of I know best. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're actually having an honest conversation with people to say, 
to acknowledge first on our part that there are other factors to consider in care besides just the, the medical treatment. Um, and so I think we're getting better at navigating that and, and choosing which one to tackle first. Um, I think at a system level though also, and this is some of the work that, that our organization is I think just beginning to wade into around health anchor networks and really thinking about how do we as potentially the largest employer or largest organization in a particular area partner with our communities so mm -hmm. that we are, you know, not just identifying a problem or even trying to solve it on, on our own, that we're partnering with the ecosystem that already exists. There are entire communities that have some infrastructure and how can we amplify that? How can we buoy that? How can we make it more robust? Um, and so that's some of the work that I think is really exciting. I, a lot of that that I've read is coming out of Chicago. That might just because regionally I'm closest to Chicago. So sorry to anyone who's out there that's doing it also. Um, but but I think there's like really good work being done around how do we actually care for a patient in the community? Yeah. Yeah, it's such an important uh, conversation for us to continue to have, I think, because again, most of our lives are not lived um, in front of our care team, <laughs> thankfully. Um, right. <laughs> we, all, we all are appreciative of that. So we talked a little bit about evidence-based medicine and I want to I want to drill down on that a bit and and I think you have some strong feelings around this as well. Um, we're hearing so Micromedics has been an evidence-based medicine um, focused organization for the 50 years mm -hmm. almost coming up next year um, that we've been around and and there's always been this discussion around there's evidence-based practice and there's eminence-based practice. And, and I think the last probably 10 years have heard more and more about that there's a place for both of those things. Um, neither neither in, in to the ex exclusion of the other. Um, so, for, so first part of my question around this is what what is the um, you know, person, again, sitting in your shoes, in your organization, what, what's the philosophy around eminence versus evidence or in conjunction with evidence? Yeah, I think I might, I think I might be agreeing with the role of both and not at the exclusion. Um, I, there, I think there's two limitations around evidence-based medicine. And to be clear, like I am a huge fanatic for evidence-based medicine um, in all areas, <laughs> not just medicine. So evidence-based decision-making. Yes. Um, <laughs> But I think one of the things that I really noticed over the last several years is, is this concept of there you can't develop the evidence quick enough, mm -hmm. right? So we certainly saw this with um, COVID vaccine technology and you know not being able to keep up as quickly as we needed to because thoughtful evidence takes time and rigor and all of these constructs. So I think that the pace is something that I think you have to be able to inter have an intersection of both. Mm -hmm. um, I think and there are risks in that, to be fair. Sure. Um, there, the other one I think about is is where the 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 rigor I appreciate around evidence based medicine or the way we construct a trial um, doesn't allow for the variation in population or application that might be useful. And I'll I'll give you a specific example actually from yesterday. Um, I was talking with a solid organ transplant provider, and we were. I was being taught about all the developing technology and solid organ transplant around how you transport organs, which is so cool. Okay. Um, but we were talking about some of the limitations in that the, the transport devices that they're using that are better and allow organs to last longer, the trials for those, many of the patients don't meet the criteria for the trial. So the trial is very small. The evidence yeah. is out there. And it's very clear in what this practitioner said very clearly was in practice, we're going to use this more broadly. I've already talked to the, the manufacturer about these other changes or these other adaptations so that we can bring more organs into this model. But it really hit me around this idea that like evidence and then the provider said, and in clinical practice, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. And so I think there has to be the intersection. Yeah, I did too. It's, it's interesting because there's there's really three categories, right? There's, there's our traditional evidence-based medicine that has all of the limitations you just talked about and all of the power and strength that it has provided for, you know, mm -hmm. years as well. Um, there's eminence. So I've been a practicing clinician for X number of 
years in this this particular patient population, and here's what I've done and seen and how it was worked in clinical practice. And then there's the real world data of not just my clinical practice, but yours and his and theirs and everybody else's. Um, and what does real world data say? That probably is the one that most thoroughly reflects the if your if your data set's big enough that thoroughly reflects the full population. Um, going back to your earlier comments about um, the disparities and things like that, the evidence, as we know, often does not reflect um, the breadth of our patient population for for all sorts of valid reasons, but but troublesome um, results at the end. <laughs> so, so I'm hearing you say that that I, I agree that there's sort of this the, the happy spot is this combination of maybe all three of those things. Um, are you, do you see a, a lean one way or the other um, generationally on either evidence or eminence? Uh, I think maybe. It depends a little bit on the environment that I'm that we're in. Mm -hmm. I think I have I'll say the luxury of working in a big academic medical center. So a lot of the practitioners I work mm -hmm. with are trained to review and to really understand evidence-based medicine and and to utilize that as a foundation um i think where i see you know you talked a little bit about like patients out in the wild mm -hmm. and i think where we're running into increasingly a disconnect is the evidence-based medicine that our practitioners even our our different generations of practitioners know and the way that different generations access and and ingest information and even internalize that. And so I have, the, I have, um, I'm the oldest of four siblings and I have these conversations often with one of my siblings who's younger than me about what information she's reading and how that compares to or doesn't compare to the trials that exist or the evidence that we've seen even in our own populations. And so I think there, there is an opportunity to figure out how to bridge those two worlds in a meaningful way to say, okay, this is what we see in real world evidence or even greater data sets to say, maybe to go back to our initial, to have an honest conversation that we've learned since then, right? Like yeah. we did this trial, we've now opened it up across the nation or the world, and here's what we've learned. And it doesn't make us, it doesn't make it wrong or invalid. It's just, mm -hmm. we like everybody else are growing and adapting and so is the data. And so I think there's a way to continue to connect those. Yeah, and not only a way, but actually a, a mandate, if you will, right? right. We, we owe that too ourselves and our patients for um, learning as it's got, got more experience in it. Um, so another thing that we are hearing often in the micromedics space, and I'd love your take on this, um, is requests for information even when there isn't great evidence. And that's something that we've really had to think long and hard about how, what the, where the line is and how it will be used. Um, again, going back to the HCP conference that I mentioned where we had 20 or 30 pharmacists in the room, sort of heard we have some of the people in the room only want only good solid evidence. Other people in the room want good solid evidence and then less solid evidence, but be clear about it, that it's not solid evidence. And then yet another faction wanted both, but only some users could see both. <laughs> Um, which of course makes our job very hard, but but nonetheless, we'll <laughs> we'll think about uh, if there's a way for us to execute on something like that. What's your take on that? When the evidence either doesn't exist for because it's a patient population issue, you know, pediatrics, rare diseases, what have you, um, or to your example of COVID, we just haven't it hasn't been enough time to get strong evidence. Um, you know, when when COVID was really blowing up, there just wasn't the evidence that we even have today. What's your take on how an organization like Micromedics could, should approach that, and then the pharmacist's role um, in those circumstances where the evidence either doesn't exist or isn't particularly strong. Yeah, I think I do think there is a role. Um, I'm probably closer to, at least what in my circles is a less popular opinion. I, mm -hmm. I think for a long time, the role, I would say specifically the role of pharmacists in medication information or drug information was to and really, I think if I understand the foundation of micromedics, the foundation of micromedics was to cull the information and to present it. Mm -hmm. I think part of what I wonder about now is the role of 
experts, whether that's a platform like Micrometics or an individual expert in helping curate. And I think exactly as you describe, you know, categorize. This is, it's, you know, we've given levels of evidence, different categories for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, different guidelines have different strengths of recommendations. And so I think there's models out there that we could adapt to say, you know, this is this is what we know, this is the strength of the evidence. And, and I do think there's value in presenting information that is less robust. Um, and, and I would be freer with that information with the, um, you know, kind of caveat that this is not as well understood or not as well demonstrated. And I think that transparency is important because of what we've seen over the last several years. I think there, that when we, when we don't see, um, like when we don't see the evidence and then the evidence comes out, I'll say we being the general population, I'll use my sister as an example. When we don't see the evidence and the evidence comes out, it feels like it, there was dishonesty. Yeah. That, that, or the, there is the potential for it to feel like there was dishonesty, like someone was keeping this information from the public or from the patient. And whether that's true or not, that perceived risk I think is risky for healthcare overall and for evidence in general. So I think being able to say, look, here is the strength of the evidence and where we think that, that the treatment decision lies and how I'm making that decision. And I also want to honor that there is there are these two studies that are poorly constructed that had different outcomes, right? And here's why I don't think that evidence is good so that people can be, you know, going back to like shared decision making and all that, so people can make a shared a, a decision in in conjunction with providers to say, yeah, I saw that evidence also. Why doesn't that work for me? Or why are you not choosing that? Instead of feeling like, the again, the maternalistic or paternalistic, like you're just withholding or making a decision for me. I think that that locus of control will be increasingly important as we move forward with generations. Yeah, it's interesting. So I, I started my career in pediatrics where there's often not sufficient evidence for all sorts of very valid reasons. <laughs> I, I didn't sign my children up for clinical trials on anything either. So, <laughs> um, and we had lots of conversations around there's a case study or there's there's a very small trial that was done that had all sorts of problems with the methodology, what have you, but it's what we have. And so we'll take that in, into consideration with all of the caveats that we just built around it um, and make the best decision we can with what we do know or, or God forbid, having to look at adult studies and, and decide whether you can extrapolate or oftentimes not. So, um, I like your perspective on it. The getting back to sort of a, a tool that may not have, you know, if a either a more junior, or newer to their practice, pharmacist, or some other, you know, a, a, another um, uh, healthcare provider may not have a pharmacist standing next to them saying, "Here, let me let me join you in the interpretation of that." Do you have any guidance or thoughts on? Um, that idea of different views versus the same view for all, but just clear caveats built around it. Um, I'm trying to think about how you, how I could create a system to replicate what I enjoy now. So one of the things that I really enjoy now is the opportunity. So we talked a little bit about AI. I like the idea of AI to help improve foundational application of good evidence across all populations. If that's the, the belief I work on, then there are always opportunities where the evidence doesn't apply specifically or you know what we've talked about. And in those instances, I go to people that I know are experts in the field, right? Because I work, I'll, I'll stick with oncology as a, as a model. Like I work with a nationally recognized team of oncology pharmacists. So I have the luxury of asking them to say, the data in this particular field is terrible. Like, what do you, what would you recommend? And I think our our care teams do that also. What I'm trying to wrap my brain around is like, how do you how do you begin to build some foundation of that for others, right? Even if it's yeah. just like, here are the here are the questions I would ask, or here are the components, like mechanism of action. What is the biochemistry? Would it apply? Like, can I pull from that? And and so I, I'm not, I don't know if I have a fully baked idea on that, but I think that's where like I would try and pull from that construct. 
Yeah, that's interesting. And and to your point, figuring out how to do that for those people who don't have the luxury that you have of working at a right. medical center the size of yours. And you know, if they're in the middle of nowhere, US or or in case of many of our clients, middle of nowhere, some other country. <laughs> um, how do we, as a provider like Micromedics, still um, give as much insight as possible, even in the lack of um, you know really well done, robust robust evidence, which perhaps takes us back to um, more real world data infused in, you know, so this, this may not be a randomized controlled t trial of 10,000 people, but, but it's better than a case study of two people. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Well, this was a pleasure. Lindsay, is there any other things around the topic of patient safety and, and how technology process and or people, um, approaches should be applied in your mind that we didn't talk about? I mean, I don't really think there's anything that we've missed. I, I would um, emphasize the ongoing conversation with artificial intelligence and advanced analytics. I think there's so much opportunity, um, particularly in, in the types of environments we're talking about with um, inequities and how do we begin to close gaps regardless of where you are being seen, right? Whether that's middle of nowhere, US or somewhere abroad, rural versus urban, academic versus community, how do we continue to have the information available and maybe even recommended, right? So that it's 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 more likely that the best evidence is applied across all populations. I think the other part of that, and I also would, would highlight is what you were saying around the lack of diversity within trials, mm -hmm. um, both from a special population standpoint, like pediatrics, or even like geriatrics, but also thinking about even diversity of population across right. the greater population in, in nations. And so I think those are things where like continuing to get that data, I think is something where, not that micromedics can help, but I do think that's something that we as an as an organ, as a institution, as a nation need to do better. Yeah, yeah, as a, I think as healthcare ecosystem around the world, I think that everybody would cheers to that sentiment that um, the more the evidence reflects the entirety of the population, the better decisions will be made for the individuals in those populations, right? Yeah. Which we all want in, in the event that we're in one of the underrepresented <laughs> underrepresented uh, demographics. So Lindsay, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. Um, hopefully the uh, audience enjoyed the chat and came away with a few thoughts to take back to their organization. Feel free to um, reach back out to us. Uh, hopefully the, the Becker's folks can jump on here and, and give a process to do that. But appreciate your time in, in particular, Lindsay, and thank you to all in the audience for joining us as well. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you as well. Good. And with that, we'll turn it back over to our Becker's friends. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, that is all the time we have for today. So I do want to thank Dr. Kelly and Dr. Moen for that excellent discussion and also to Micromedics for sponsoring today's webinar. For more information on today's content, please check out the additional resources located on the webinar console. And please do not forget to fill out our webinar survey. Thank you again for joining us today and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon.